The following interview was conducted with Professor David A. Landgrip for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, November 27, 2007, at Stewart Center B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and Thank good you. afternoon. And tell us a little bit about your early years, parents, where you were born, and your siblings. Well, I was born and raised in a small town in southern Indiana, Huntingburg, down towards Evansville. Actually, it's on US 231. Uh, and uh, graduated from high school there and came to Purdue from there. How, what was high school like and how large was the school and uh, how well, large the town? Tell us a little bit about the, the town. The town was about 4,000 people. Okay. It was a basketball crazy town as uh, small Indiana towns are supposed to be. Uh, the high school gym when I graduated would seat 5,000 people and regularly filled. Uh, are your parents, were they, are they natives of that area? Uh, well, they're nearby, yes. Okay. Uh, my parents had a small business, a clothing store, clothing and shoes, and that kept them close to, uh, close to home all the time because if they weren't there, it wouldn't happen. And so I was sort of one of the original latchkey kids when I came home from school. I, I always stopped at the store and there was usually things for me to do or whatever. Right. Uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? I had one older brother. Uh-huh. And then after, were you active in any activities in high school at all? Or? Yes, quite a few. Well, tell uh, us a few I, of those. Well, I played basketball early on, but uh, that really wasn't going anywhere. But uh, I was involved in a lot of different uh, high school activities. Okay. All right. How large was your graduating class? Seventy-six. The size of the school was approximately how many? Oh, a couple hundred. Two hundred and fifty. Oh, okay. Something so you, like that. Then, uh, what prompted school. you? How did you happen to come to Purdue? Tell us. Well, um, my father had wanted to be an engineer when he grew up, and he started at Purdue. And uh, he got just started, and unfortunately, my grandfather, who had the business at that time, became ill, and he had to go home and rescue the business. And so he was at that for uh, a while. And then when uh, he was able to get away again, he, he went to the University of Michigan and got a business degree. So he never really got to be an engineer. But uh, there was always uh, that kind of thinking around, and indeed I tinkered a lot with electronics when I was in high school and uh, did TV repair and that kind of thing. Got some hands-on experience there. Right. Yeah. So it was sort of preordained that I would go somewhere to engineering school, and I looked hard at uh, uh, Purdue, and because I had some connection here by then, I had Dad had taken me to a football game or two and that kind of thing. And I also looked at University of Cincinnati, uh, but I decided in favor of Purdue. Okay. And uh, when did you arrive at Purdue then? That was uh, in the fall of 1952. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your experiences as a student and what campus was like and do you live on campus and fraternities? And yes, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I moved into, well it was Hall X at that time, it's Meredith now I guess, when it was brand new and opening and indeed it really wasn't even completely finished when, I, when we moved in. There were a lot of things that weren't done so we uh, got to initiate a lot of facilities. <laughs> uh, did you have uh, did, did you have a roommate and uh, tell us had a roommate what was the uh, campus? Who, who I didn't know hadn't known before, uh -huh. uh, but uh, he and I got along fine. We uh, and what were, was the campus like? This is in the early fifties. Yeah, right? it was much smaller, obviously, than it is now. Almost all the students lived quote on campus. That is either in the residence halls or in um, the uh, fraternity sororities. Uh, but there were still a lot of veterans around from uh, actually in the Second World War and from uh, the, Korean the Korean War. War uh -huh. And uh, so there was a lot in, uh, in uh, uh, married housing. Uh, there were uh, a row of, uh, we called them shacks, and I think they did too, that stood in the area where uh, the H's, H buildings were built. Uh, and uh, so there were a lot of older students than, than I and students who worked very hard. So you were motivated to uh, Stick work with very it. hard <laughs> to <laughs> try to hang still, in there. Yeah, you still wanted to be an engineering. Is that what you wanted yes, to do? Uh -huh. Yes. 
And was the village, was that, uh, what was, describe a little bit what that was like? Uh, it was smaller and of course the biggest change I suppose would be the amount of traffic that was around. You could uh, conveniently walk to the village and cross about anywhere in the, the street at, uh, and the like. But it was not a lot different than now. Okay, and they had they have the trolley. They still have the trolleys there. Trolleys were gone. Oh, they were gone by yeah. then. Okay. Yeah. And then tell us a little bit about uh, after what was your course of study after you undergraduate work? Then what what came next? Well, I graduated uh, in 1956 and took a job with Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. But it was pretty clear that uh, my education wasn't finished. I very quickly determined that I didn't know everything I needed to know. So I came back that fall and to uh, Purdue. To Purdue and and started a master's degree. Tried to get away to industry whenever I could as in graduate school. Uh, after a, a year in graduate school, I guess it was, uh, I took a job as a residence hall counselor and I helped open. Uh, it was H1 then, I guess Owen Hall now. Oh, okay. uh, I was in the position of, uh, it was called faculty sponsor, but I wasn't faculty, but I was uh, responsible for one wing of the building, I and, and three other uh, counselors. And uh, That must th have been a nice experience. That was an experience too. Yeah. You learn a lot about manhood by being that close to a bunch of guys who are growing up and trying to figure out what it's like to be a, a little more out on their own than they right. had been before. And, right. Was does the faculty program in existence at that time? The, the faculty fellow program? Was no, that not really. Oh, uh, and Hovde, of course, started that, and I just wondered. I forget the years when it really got yes. started. Jack Smalley was uh, Mr. Residence Halls at the time. Uh, Bill Burner was Bill, um, yeah. a residence hall uh, manager at the time, and. Uh, so uh, I got to know them pretty pretty closely, pretty well. Yeah, Bill Burner was in Owen Hall. Was he the manager there, or just well, Bob Page was the an manager of uh, of Owen Hall when I when I moved in it. Okay. Bob is gone since. Right. And your uh, graduate was in electrical engineering. Electrical. Oh, okay. And so I really had th uh, three degrees from Purdue. I kept uh, had the Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, then a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering, then a PhD. Okay. And it I kept going away. Uh, first to the East Coast and then to the West Coast, but always seemed to end, back, end up back here. Well, after you received your PhD, then what came next? Well, then was the problem of deciding what did I want to do because there weren't any more degrees that were logical. And uh, I finally decided that uh, uh, academia looked pretty good. As a master's student, I had a teaching assistantship. And uh, one bright September morning, that was when fall semester started then, I went to my mailbox and there was a book and a course outline, you are going to teach the following course. And before that it had been laboratory uh, kinds of stuff. But uh, I'll That's tell you, trying to motivate a bunch of civil engineers to try to learn something about electrical engineering was a challenge. But I found that I enjoyed it a great deal and I decided then to, to stay in academia Right. and accepted an assistant professorship in electrical engineering. Okay. Now your research area is signal theory and signal representation and then let's move on to Lars. You were the director for quite a period of time. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Lars was formed in 1966. Uh, probably a, a pivotal thing for me professionally was when Ralph Shea, who was then the head of the botany and plant pathology department. Here at Purdue. Here at Purdue. Came over to give a departmental uh, lecture at Double E, uh, suggesting this rather odd idea that engineers and agriculturalists should work together because we got this thing called space that's up there. The, uh, of course, uh, Sputnik had gone up in '57, so that was all. Everything was all new. The, gee, the, even the Flat Earth Society was still quite active. They couldn't believe that you could really have a have a satellite that stayed up there indefinitely. But Ralph had had this idea that. Uh, there were, was a need for better management techniques for agriculture in particular. And uh, he had been the chairman of a National Academy of Sciences Committee uh, to look into remote aerial surveys in agriculture. This had not been done? This had not been done before, okay. no. Uh, and uh, so he, he uh, got this idea of starting a thing which ultimately became Lars. <coughs> now, 
that committee had people on it, uh, a gentleman from the University of Michigan and a gentleman from the University of, of California, Berkeley. <coughs> and his idea was to have a collaboration between those three institutions because they sort of spanned the problem. Uh, um, Purdue, of course, had the engineering, but they had agriculture. Michigan had a uh, program in remote aerial surveys. They had a, an aircraft already instrumented. And uh, the man from the forestry department of the University of California, Berkeley, had a, uh, already a national rep reputation in the area of using air photography and in the field of forestry. So we started to work on it. And uh, two other faculty members here at Purdue uh, were, they were both more senior than I, really. Uh, well, one of them was more senior than I, the, uh, Professor Roger Holmes from electrical engineering and a postdoc from forestry, Roger Hoffer. Uh, and we sort of coalesced around the, the four of us to uh, begin to sort out what Lars might be or what a Lars might be by, like. And so it, f it was formally declared to begin in the, like, the early uh, winter of 1966. And uh, we started meeting uh, in a room in, uh, over on the ag side of the campus. But it was apparent to us that that wasn't going to work because we only saw one, one another like once a week when we met. And that wasn't enough cross communication to make it go. So we, we sought out some more research grants and we sought out some space where we could have a, a home. And at that time, the research park was there, but it was not doing very well. And there was a bunch of empty space out there. So they suggested, why didn't we go out to the research park, which we did. And, and we then established our offices there and, and were there all day long. And that provided the kind of cross communication that it was important to have right. to make that kind of interdisciplinary work work. I know I was going to ask you about it was known as McClure Park at that time. It wasn't was. It? And uh, it was very small. Yes, yes it was. Um, Incidentally, there's water down there if you need some. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, there, was, there were some companies that had become interested in it, but uh, I remember in particular RCA had some space in a building that, that we moved into uh, the, uh, on Potter Drive. But it wasn't working very well, apparently, because they discontinued their work. Well, fortunately, we were beginning to grow at the same time. So as space became available in the building, <coughs> we, um, were able to we were able to glomp onto it. Sure. And it wasn't very long that we were large enough that uh, that building, it was called Flex Lab 1 then, yeah. was not, uh, not, at, not big enough. And we uh, got some space then in Flex Lab 2 which uh, was terrific from our standpoint, except from a management standpoint, it's more complicated because not only were we re remote from campus, we were also remote from half of our staff. And uh, I learned pretty quickly as the, the director that uh, absence does make what the heart go yonder. Uh, various kinds of personnel problems have to be sorted out when uh, when you have that kind of a situation. Yeah. How did you happen to be the director, become director? Was I was standing around leaning on my shovel and it happened. I don't really know. <laughs> uh, we need a director. <laughs> yeah, and uh, somebody decided that I should be it. We were uh, sort of under the, uh, well... Uh, what was the reporting structure? The reporting that? structure, we reported uh, at first to the uh, Associate Dean of Engineering and the Associate Dean of Agriculture jointly. Uh, and uh, they sort of decided that uh, uh, I should be the director. Roger Holmes was, was moved elsewhere. He had gone off campus and uh, Roger Hoffer was still working his way into an academic position. And other people were beginning to join us. And uh, Ralph Shea had uh, left the campus, taken an equivalent job at the University of Oregon or Oregon State, excuse me. And uh, so I guess I was just sort of it. Where is the staffing coming from? How was this? And did you keep in contact with Berkeley and Michigan? We did for a long time. Okay. Uh, so there was a, like a consortium between those three yes, institutions. Yes. Uh, Michigan <coughs> had an, this aircraft that served as a data collection capability for us. And uh, 
Berkeley had uh, folks and graduate students and a faculty member in uh, forestry, but we were really w wanting to focus more on agriculture as such, agronomy and uh, forestry. And uh, so s slowly but surely, I guess really the thing that did it was the fact that we were all in a single location and we really could communicate with one another. and. Uh, we got along very well with the other sites, but uh, the communication just wasn't as easy. Mm -hmm. Where was the funding coming from at that? The funding to get came that first. Off the, off the <coughs> excuse me. The first funding we had <coughs> came from. Uh, there you go, that fresh. <coughs> the first funding came from the Department of Agriculture and was arranged pretty much by Ralph Shea and was stimulated by that uh, National Academy committee that he had been on. Um, there was a gentleman in the uh, Agricultural Research Service of the US, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Arch Park, who became sort of the Keystone government contact. And at one, some point, he moved over to NASA, NASA <coughs> because the technology was all going that direction for this, this part of the technology. And uh, so at, at that point then the funding began with, uh, with NASA and it grew rather rapidly because NASA was a very young organization at that time. And of course NASA had only been formed in 1958 and they were still casting around really looking for what can we do with this capability of operating in space. And one of the things they latched onto was looking back at the Earth from space. And uh, so the weather satellites were all, are already starting, and then there was the land, and that was us. And so uh, we were working towards uh, creating a capability that from satellites one could monitor first just agricultural resources, but then it rapidly spread to all kinds of uh, earth surface cover, uh, geography and geology and, and the like. Okay, and really expanded and took off. Did your staff grow at the it same did. time? And it space? did, and that's where that's where I I became. I had to learn something about administration, uh, organizing, keep motivating people, keeping things going, getting the big proposals written, and all that kind of thing. Was funding fairly easy in those days? Or? Uh, I guess you'd say it was because we never really had a funding problem. We grew quite rapidly. Uh, by the 1970s, we had, uh, well, from throughout the 70s, we had between 120 and 150 people, paid staff. Wow. So it was by far the largest research project on the campus. Um, and there are always scary times when uh, one contract ends and another one begins, but uh, we never really had a problem. But I think we scared the daylights out of administrators on campus because they, they were looking at us with those hundred people that were, un, uh, were staff members, and what if a contract doesn't come in? So uh, frankly, they were not really prepared for interdisciplinary team research. Uh, that was something new, and we were a little bit ahead, ahead of our time. Uh, and uh, so there was rather than a really strong support from at least the academic part of the community, uh, there was more apprehension, I would say. During uh, that time. During that time. Sure. Yeah. Were you now uh, everybody can spell the word interdisciplinary really easily. <laughs> right. Then it was not so easy. <laughs> what about it's, it made a great contribution to the university in the field of remote sensing? Uh, address those two points. That all came out of, out of that area. What actually happened uh, for me personally, what sure. happened was I heard Ralph Shea's presentation at that EE uh, seminar. seminar that I mentioned. I had just come back from a job uh, in with Douglas Aircraft Company. They were looking at how to um, use sensors to and pattern recognition devices, which was a new technology at that time, to monitor uh, human uh, functions. Uh, I worked for a while on a contract uh, to determine the stages of sleep for the Navy. Uh, I worked for a while with analyzing data from a, uh, a number of uh, 
epileptics that had been instrumented in the UCLA uh, hospital to see if we could determine from electroencephalograms uh, to be able to predict when a seizure was was coming. Was occur, right. And that all caused me to learn a little bit about pattern recognition methods. Well, when I came back and I heard Ralph Shea give his presentation about doing that, I, I, it occurred to me that, okay, you can make pictures from space, but you were never going to be able to handle all the data by doing picture analysis. So it wasn't going to be a photographic, it wasn't going to be an imaging kind of thing. What, what struck me was that maybe it could be a spectral kind of a thing. So what we started working on was measuring the spectral return from a spot on the ground to see if we could learn how to, to identify what was in that spot on the ground. And that, that's what started it all. And it just grew from there. And it just grew from there. Right. One of the people that I read uh, is that John Peterson, who was head of agronomy, even after he stepped aside, he came over and helped. Bless his heart, because I was up to my ears in administrative details, and I was just a young associate professor, had just been tenured, uh, and had never had an administrative responsibility before. And I spoke to the... Uh, Associate Dean of Agriculture of, about the problem because I felt since I was an engineer we needed something from the agricultural side of the house and he said well why don't you go <coughs> visit with Doc Pete uh, he's stepping down as head of the agronomy department after 20 I think 29 years right. uh, why don't you talk to him so I he said he's going to have his uh, retirement gathering over in the union in a few days go and see him there. Well, I thought, okay, department head, that'll be a nice little gathering. I went over there and it turned out there were 500 people there in both North and South ballrooms. And that was my first real clue of what kind of an individual Doc Pete was because people came back from all over the world to be there for his retirement. He'd been there, had 48, you know. Yeah, very long time. And he was obviously widely respected, both here at Purdue and, and elsewhere. elsewhere. Sure. And I talked to him and asked him if he would come on and, and give me a hand. So he came on as associate director. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of heart-to-heart -heart talks, and I learned a lot about, uh, about administration. He was a good mentor, it sounds to me. Oh, like. yes, he yeah. was tremendous. Right. Just the right person. Yeah. What was, uh, how did, was, with Lars, were you, were you doing teaching at the same, was it? Uh, yeah. Okay. I continued to teach one course a semester. And, mm -hmm. And, and do that. And that was pretty much the model that we followed, that we didn't want the faculty that were involved to leave their, their own field. We wanted them to bring their own field to us. So we had faculty from uh, the, the various schools and departments with specialties that, that mm -hmm. matched what we were trying to do. And that's, that's how they, uh, they made their contribution, sure. but they didn't disconnect connect right. themselves from and you got graduate students uh, along the way too. And did you have some did you have undergraduates too? Or helping? Oh yes. Out? Okay. It, that must have been a new area. For by uh, by the nineteen by nineteen seventy, we had we it turned out we had to have our own computation facility. We started doing work through the Purdue University Computing Center, and at that time it was a process of you programmed up what you wanted and punched it on punch cards and you submitted it, and then the next morning come out and see whether it had run or not, and it was driving our, our some, particularly our professional staff, up the wall. We just needed a more interactive situation. So the summer of, uh, I guess it was 66, I spent a good part of the summer working through all the, the rungs of the ladder to get our own computer. We had the funding, that wasn't the problem, but it was... Uh, Getting it up and running. Well, getting permissions to buy this, and uh, we had to have a defense rating in order to get the computer and all that. So we got our first computer then, <coughs> and it was a it was a big hit. It really made the difference, but very quickly it was not big enough. <coughs> so it must have been about 1979 or so. We got a large mainframe timeshare system. And we recognized that uh, if this was successful, one of the problems would be to export the technology to the user community. So we set up a, a capability whereby 
one could use a terminals off of that, uh, time, that timeshare system, something that was really very unique at the time. Uh, and we set up training materials and the like. And I talked to Professor John Linenlaub from Electrical Engineering to join us as, as the head of our technology transfer group to make these training materials so that they could uh, be useful in giving people who didn't have the full background but had the full need to be able to use the technology. And then we had remote terminals that went out. We had remote terminals first between the two buildings, but then it, we started spinning it off to uh, other NASA centers, other universities, and the like. Mm -hmm. So it was a, um, a really a, a useful tool. Um, and when you say that and you think of it in today's times, it it's, was unique at that time. It was and quite unique at that time. Very yeah. fortunate that you were able to do that. Most people looked at what we were trying to do and say, you can't, you can't analyze images remotely. <coughs> you won't be able to have the, the transfer rates. <coughs> and the first thing about that was, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> we weren't analyzing images. We were analyzing individual spectra. You want to take a break for a few minutes? Uh, let's just huh? take a swig here. Okay. And uh, the second part of it was, <coughs> well, you can because you really don't need all that much. And indeed, we used some, a couple of, they were satchel-sized portable computers that one could carry around and connect in by dial-up. Uh, and do analysis. We had all the data, we had thousands of reels of data uh, at the mainframe. So all the person that wanted to, had to do that, that wanted to analyze a frame of data was uh, notify the operators what data they wanted to use and, and they would mount it on a tape unit and then they could control it from there. Mm -hmm. Well, we decided also that it would be very useful for undergraduate experience to hire undergraduates as the computer operators. And we had a 24 hour a day, seven day a week operation, so we needed a lot of them. So there was that to get mm -hmm. sorted out and get working. What did you do about archiving? Do you still have, the, is that on tapes or what What occurred? Has that, occurred? We think about that in today's times. Yeah, we because do. Because people that, ask what we're going to do with this and. That pretty much went away uh, at the, uh, it, it was a lot to store. It wasn't clear to anybody who was going to use it in the future and the like. Uh, it, it was, and it was not clear, well, one of the things that happened was during that period, I attended a meeting at NASA Goddard, at which there was one of their gurus on data and data processing there, and I asked him the question, how long does, does data on tape last? And his answer was, we're required to keep our data tapes 10 years. And I said, no, that's not the question. The question is, how long does it last? And he said, we're required to keep our data 10 years. The answer was, we don't know. But the tape was such that, well, some of it was useful for longer periods of time, but sure. it would deteriorate uh, yeah. ultimately. Now, you, when did you move from McClure, and where was your facility on campus? For I, Some of these things are directed, the researchers are going to be using the yeah. material. Um, what occurred there was we were having to pay for all of our computing expenses, uh, the rental of the equipment and the whole works. If we had been on campus, of course, the, the campus facility was highly subsidized by the university. So we were spending uh, of the order of a quarter to a half of our total budget on just keeping the lights on on the computer. Because of the remote, remote, remote facility? And the whole thing was evolving uh, the maturity of the computing world and all the rest uh, at that time. And uh, so uh, we decided that, that, oh, one of the keystones was that the campus got a computer for the, their use that on which our software would run. We had been totally IBM software and uh, the early machines on campus were control data machines. and. Mm -hmm they got a machine that we could move to campus with. So the idea was to move it to campus, but then to, to remote out this capability to the various departments that uh, would want to have somebody use it. And that's pretty much what drove it. 
Okay. But where were you set, set up then? Here, you had offices. Everybody went back to their own departments. Okay, but the remote thing, you could tie it in, so there, there was yeah. a linkage there. In other yes. words, I yes. see. Okay. Um, Landsat, what was it? that was a series of satellites that Landsat. Tell us just a little bit about that. Okay, we had pretty early success with the idea of using spectral data. <coughs> and the first uh, weather observing satellites went up in the early 60s. But there had been nothing for looking at the land. But I'm not sure how it all came about, frankly, for, on the national scene, I, but I have a feeling that what took place was the people that were sold NASA of the weather satellites said, hey, we could look at the land, too. All we have to do is change the dynamic range of the instrument so that it's looking at the dark land instead of the bright clouds. <coughs> at any rate, NASA was anxious to be in the satellite business, and we had demonstrated through aircraft data that you could map out crops and uh, other classes of, of materials by that time, so it sort of began to flow together. And the first uh, Landsat then was was sort of put together in about 1968 or 69. And it was uh, finally launched in July of 72. They built <coughs> three identical satellites. And the plan was to launch one and use it until it its life was up and then to launch the second and then the third. <coughs> so that's what they did. But the technology was pretty primitive from our standpoint because we were using me spectral measurements and the Michigan system could measure the radiation in up to 18 spectral bands uh, from the blue all the way through the uh, visible through the reflective infrared through to the thermal infrared. You couldn't do that with the kinds of sensors that were on the weather satellites. They just didn't work out in, into the infrared. And uh, there was a body of people who were very anxious to get uh, image type data, uh, data that had good image type geometry, two dimensional images. And that was less important to us. What was more important to us was to have the spectral content. So there was a real battle that went on that there should be an imaging capability or a spectral capability. And Finally, the government resolved it in the way that governments do. They put both on board. And <coughs> that, that was fine. called consensus? Yeah. <coughs> that was fine, except that, fortunately for us, soon after the launch of the satellite, the imaging system failed. And the photogrammetrists were stuck with our line scan type data, which didn't have the kind of geometry they were used to. But it was all there was. <laughs> but there were only four spectral bands as compared to the uh, 16 or 18 we'd been used to using. So we were anxious to see something better come along. And it finally did uh, when it was decided to do a second generation Landsat system in the middle 70s. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Then one, one thing, uh, that mine devegetation of 1979, Lars was involved in that. I happened to see an article on that, and I thought our researchers would. In, in the in mine what? devegetation, uh, there was some mining that was devegetating. They might be oh, using Lars or something like there that. Was, there were all kinds of applications. Uh, the, the extractive industry was, was, of course, part of it. <laughs> but so was, <coughs> excuse me. So was the uh, ge geography folks that were interested in urban areas. Forestry was a big thing, but agronomy was a very important area. Excuse me, do you want to take a little break? Huh? Oh, no. Well, we'll take a little break for one second and give it a chance. Okay. Is that okay, Brian? Rob. Okay, Rob. I don't Rob. know how it'll work. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, then you, in 81, uh, you became the Associate Dean of Engineering and Director of Engineering Experiment Station. What were some of the challenges and the uh, Well, I, that I, came I had decided that? Uh, late in the, in the 70s, early 80s, that the technology had gotten to the point that the direction of Lars really needed to be in the hands of, a, of somebody on the application side rather than the technology side. So, so I decided it was appropriate for me to step down. and. I no more than did that, and I got tapped to be the Associate Dean of Engineering. Uh, uh, the gentleman that had that position left the university, and there was an empty 
an opening there. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> the, um, the, the idea of interdisciplinary research, though, was beginning to pop. And so there was by then the Potter Building, which was filled with people of different backgrounds. And uh, the dean needed somebody to watch over that kind of thing. There was a, a program that he was starting. Uh, Who was the dean at that time? Uh, it became John Hancock okay. shortly. Yeah. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a program that was to improve the efficiency of manufacturing activities. And it was to be a joint activity between the Purdue academics and uh, industry. So John went out and talked uh, some industries out of contributing a, a million bucks each and putting a, a rep, their, one of their representatives here. And, and that program then went forward. Mm -hmm. <coughs> What was the engineering experiment station? How what, did, what was I that? would have to say that it was really pretty much at the end of its life. <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, oh. it was a very active kind of a thing. But it, in, in, in the time that I was involved with it, it had only one activity that was funded in the way that it had traditionally been funded, that is, through the, through the state. Some other states had uh, experiment stations that were state-funded. And of course, the School of Agriculture had the Agricultural Experiment Station yeah. that was federally funded. Right. <clears throat> but by that time, most of the funding was uh, uh, go write a proposal to some government agency or whatever kind of thing. What sort of work did the Experiment Station do? Was it in, uh, similar to the Ag or what? No, what, it, what was it its wasn't. Function? And, and there was some work going on in civil engineering with regard to, to highways okay. that was still going on. But the rest of it was pretty much all, uh, let's help researchers in their departments I see. Uh, okay. get their research right. going or yeah. find them a place or whatever. Right. Then you became acting head of the School of Electrical Computer in 95 and 96. Some comments about that on the position. Well, what did that entail? Uh, <coughs> that was a matter of, once again, standing around leaning on my shovel handle when, when an opening turned up and somebody said I should do it. And, uh, they have a lot of respect for you. I, and they know that I you can step figure, in and get didn't moving. Learn how to say no, I guess. So no, I don't think I, so. I went into uh, when, well. Really, it was a matter of okay. I had learned something about administration with the Lars sure. thing, and by that time I had been uh, the uh, coordinator of research act, or of uh, graduate activities for Double E, okay. admitting graduate students and then monitoring their programs. And so all of that kind of came together to make it a logical kind of a thing, mm -hmm. I guess. Well, here's something. Legacy of the various heads of electrical <coughs> engineering, which is now electrical and computer engineering, since you've been here. Uh, there have been some changes in electrical engineering, such as this emphasis in power engineering and versus the emergence of electrical and computing engineering. Any comments on that? I guess so the only I comment that I would make is that uh, looking back at the undergraduate education that I got, it was relatively broad. Uh, I had to take a course in uh, civil engineering and surveying. I had to take a course in heat treating, casting, and welding in, to get a little metallurgy background. I had to take a course in mechanical drawing at that time uh, from the general engineering department. I had to take a course in heat power and a course in thermodynamics from mechanical engineering. So it was a matter of, okay, you're a double E, but you need to have some breadth. That, as time went on, slowly went away because people began to specialize more and more on just electrical engineering. And it's kind of interesting to observe all that because now what we're seeing is it's flowing back the other direction. Now we're seeing the interdisciplinary idea again and we got to get our students to have some experience in working across discipline lines. So it's kind of a reversal of what, what had been taking Interesting approach, place. yes, yeah. yes. Um, what about the uh, traditional uh, EE options, the uh, problem of attracting new students in view of the changes since virtual reality has come in as far as computing engineering is concerned. Uh, important, uh, yeah. uh, but again, it's overlaid on this interdisciplinary business. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, it's really grown a lot over yeah. the last number of yeah. years then. Um, you're talking about, we're talking about the satellite, but also the Google, you can do some, what is, uh, for people, when I think of the new researchers <coughs> that may pick up on this, a comment on, well, someone says, why didn't he say something about Google? That's my question. Well, uh, a Google, of course, is has an got imaging kind of capability. Sure. Right. And uh, 
what you're counting on there is you're going to make a picture that a human will look at. And of course, that's quite different from what we were doing. We right. were that's we, we would display the data in an image form, but we weren't really doing image processing. We were doing spectral processing to identify uh, what was going on. And that business of spectral identification has a very broad set of possible uses, most of which I, I think have not yet been explored. One example, uh, we took a lot of the software that uh, algorithms that we had worked on out at Lars, and when we came to campus, uh, Larry Beal and I, Larry is a, he's here at the university yet, but he was a professional staff person at the time. He and I got together and we started taking the results of my graduate students and putting them into this package called Multispec and then distributing it free of charge to anybody that wanted it by first mailing it on, on floppy disks, but ultimately by distributing it now over the web. And uh, it became a, a rather popular kind of a thing and it started popping up in strange places. One of the strangest to me, frankly, was uh, just about two years ago, uh, two gentlemen from France showed up and they wanted to see multispec. They came here to campus? They came here to campus and they wanted a demonstration of it. <coughs> it developed that the business they were in, they had made a device that would illuminate a picture and they were working with the uh, archiving industry, with the, the, uh, uh, the, the people who are concerned with paintings and the authentication of paintings and the like. And they had some initial evidence that indicated that it would be very useful to do that on a spectral basis because you would be able to determine what pigments were used in the painting and therefore what era the painting was actually done. Uh, and you could also investigate the techniques that the author, the, the artist had used. Uh, and they had just come from the uh, Cleveland Art Institute where they had a contract to, to image, I think, uh, 1,200 different paintings and to then carry this, this kind of thing out on it. Sure. Uh, and they were on their way to through here to go to Chicago uh, to, to talk to the uh, museum people there about the same kind of uh, same kind of thing. Well, there's a case of, okay, that one clearly is, has to do with images, but it still is spectral analysis to, to determine what's, what's going on. Uh, there's another case, I reviewed a paper here not too long ago for a group in uh, Korea who had used the same technology to de detect cancer cells or cancerous growths on the back of using mice. multispec using using multispec technology sure. I don't think they were using multispec as such but they were using the exact same technology uh, I did work s with a firm in the Boston area who were using this kind of thing to detect cervical cancer what they did was they would illuminate the cervix and measure the reflected and and uh, rate the the return that came off of it and with that, they could sort into the kind of cells that were present and therefore detect precancerous and cancerous cells. And the advantage they were claiming was that if it works, uh, first of all, it's uh, a, lot, a lot less invasive than a pap smear. And secondly, uh, it, uh, it's immediate in its results. You don't have to wait till tomorrow or next week to find out whether you got cancer or not. And uh, they got it as far as... Uh, they obtained FDA approval to use it on a clinical basis. They had run a trial in 16 different hospitals around the country and apparently passed the, the, uh, the test. And so it's been approved now. Uh, they had a website and I was keeping track of what they were doing through the website. And recently I noticed that that website isn't active anymore. I suspect what happened is they lost their funding. They were funded by a, uh, as a startup kind of company. Okay. And if, if the usage hadn't built up yet to the point that uh, it was a paying proposition on its own, then they were still dependent upon investors uh, betting that it would happen someday and they may have lost their funding. I, I really don't know. That's but at hard. any rate, that sort of illustrates the breadth of the idea yes. uh, that what you're really doing is you're really, you can sort molecules based on their spectral response. 
and, and wherever you can think of to use that, you can use it. Use it. That's interesting. In Lars today, it's, it's still on trust with current. It is. It is. is there, do you have any involvement at all in it? I really don't. I really okay. am pretty much re, uh, retired from it. My involvement today is uh, reviewing papers, uh, okay. doing a little writing, and that kind of thing. But uh, uh, most of the work today is, is in the area of the applications because, frankly, there is a delay in getting the satellites up there that are needed. Right. There's not really a, a good active satellite for that kind of thing. Right. And it's housed, who is the current head of it? Um, Melba Crawford was oh. hired by the agronomy department to be the director of LARS, and she has since established liaison with engineering and, and uh, around the campus, and she's very a very busy lady. But, oh, uh, I would imagine. Uh, <laughs> is she new, was she new to the she, university? I have known her for many years, okay. uh, but she was a professor at the University of Texas, Austin, and uh, was attracted here uh, to take that job. Oh, well, very good. That's nice. Uh, now, you've been a member of the National Research Council and the Nas NASA's Advisory Committee on Space. Tell us a little bit about some of those key committees that you served on. Well, or a key one involvement. was the first one that I was on in 1967. Uh, it was a, a study by, the way this thing works, there are, there are three parts to the National Academies. There's a National Academy of Science, there's a National Academy of Engineering, and there's an Institute of Medicine. And then there's a National Research Council, which is the operating arm of those three. And that three. still exists today, of course. Yes, yes, all of them exist today. Sure. And back in uh, 1967, NASA had tasked uh, the National Research Council <coughs> to uh, conduct a study <coughs> on, remember now we're very early in the space era, future peace uses of, peaceful uses of Earth observational satellites. Uh, never mind the spooky folks, what are we going to do in, in real life here? And they assembled <coughs> a small group of high-level people <coughs> from corporations and academias that um, sort of laid out a program. And they came up with a, a number of areas, uh, <coughs> some having to do with communications, some having, having to do with weather monitoring and ocean monitoring, some having to do with monitoring the land. <coughs> and uh, there, then there was this rather strange one that I didn't understand at the time, navigation and sav satellite, uh, navigation and, and uh, traffic control. How in the world would you ever use a satellite to monitor nav for navigation purposes? And, you know, it just, that doesn't sound practical, but they thought it was. <coughs> so what they did was they put together panels, 13 panels, to cover each of those areas, uh, and then assembled the groups at the Woods Hole, Massachusetts um, a Working Center. And we spent two weeks there uh, fleshing out their initial ideas as to how this might all work. And uh, out of that, <coughs> most all of those areas have really bloomed. Obviously, the navigation and traffic control took off when GPS happened. <coughs> the weather satellites were already underway. The communications kind of thing. There were three different fields for communication. There was point-to-point -point communication. There was point-to-points communication. That's broadcast. And there were points-to-point -point communication. That's like uh, the military folks that monitor when a pilot goes down, they can find him and all that kind of thing. Animals in the wild tracking them and that kind of thing. And there were three for the land. Uh, and uh, so a lot of the thinking came out of that one, out of that study. And that was a keystone study to this day of sort of sorting out what can satellites be used for when in connection, in direct connection with the Earth, and indeed 
in those areas where the economics is going to be the driver as compared to uh, spy satellites or whatever else. Um, will it will it be productive for our our nation from an economic standpoint? Was really the question they were after. That was a that was a, a key one. Then I've been on a number of them since that time uh, on various topics. Uh, uh, some having to do with Earth observations, some having to do with, well, I was on one for a while when the uh, National Archives were tasked to convert their holdings over to digital form. And how do you do that? And that's a hairy problem. I imagine. <coughs> yes, <you're> right. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit, um, that uh, William T. Peeker award that you got in from, uh, Laris got that on behalf of 1967, that's kind of, that's a unique, tell us a little bit about that specific award. Yeah, that's an award that is given either to a person or to a group, and in that case it was to uh, Lars, Lars right. actually jointly Lars and uh, the University of Michigan people, uh, for contributions to the field of Earth observation. And it's awarded by jointly by NASA and the Department of Interior. Uh, they have a, a committee that selects the awardees. Uh, and then you got it you? yourself too. And I got it myself later on. Later, that's very nice. Um, <coughs> what about some campus changes through the years since you came through the since the '60s? Well, it's gotten a lot bigger. Uh, it's gotten more spread out, <coughs> and probably the biggest change that the casual observer would see is that now. Students don't all live on campus, uh, and uh, that's thus all these buildings that have been built around that uh, rent out rooms and the like. Uh, what was but housing, Jeep, housing like in the fifties? There weren't as wasn't as much off that campus. Was, that was pretty unusual. There was some of that, but that was certainly not the norm. Okay. Uh, but uh, just a lot of buildings. So when I came to campus, I think the chemistry building was a hole in the ground being built. Uh, there was a, a building that set out in what's now called Academic Park that's between, uh, behind the Union there that, that was uh, Fowler Hall. It was a freestanding building. It was still, Fowler Hall was still there at that yeah, time? It was okay, a, so the Stewart's I had freshman and engineering lectures in Fowler Hall. Interesting. Uh, the library was a freestanding building and then later the whole Stewart Center was built around it, so it's still there, but nobody knows it because it <laughs> We have pictures, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, and just a lot of those kinds of things. So. Sure, right. And but some of the some and the village has all changed, and also Lafayette down at the foot of State Street. Yes, uh, a, a great deal of change. Although it's been a slow but steady migration in my in my mind. Yeah, that's true. Now you've had some. Tell us about some of your activities in the community. You've been president of the Rotary. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what are some? You and then more recently, I was the treasurer of the Lafayette Rotary Foundation for 15 okay. years. The Lafayette Rotary Foundation is the uh, <coughs> the um, arm of the organization that that uh, grants monies to uh, worthwhile uses. Uh, you may have seen in today's paper that the Rotary. The Rotary International Foundation made a, a large grant for uh, the polio eradication program. Uh, our club collects money, comes through the Lafayette Rotary Foundation and goes to the Rotary International Foundation for that. The Lafayette Rotary Foundation has a, a flow through each year of around seventy or eighty thousand dollars, something like that. And they give scholarships to high school students and uh, they give grants to various uh, worthy units around the town. Very nice. That's good. Um, <coughs> in 2003, they had that honorary workshop that they organized for you. That's very nice on advances in techniques for analysis of remote. Um, I know you were very pleased. How did, they, how did you find the, 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 how did they tell you? Sometimes I well, when, I, when they first raised it to me, my question was, do you think anybody will come? And uh, that was pointed out to me at the opening of the of the meeting <laughs> that I had said that, because they had designed the meeting for uh, like 80 people and like 70 papers, and they had to close the registration when it passed 100, and there were all people from almost 20 countries there, so it was quite a 
quite very a surprise. Very nice. Well, congratulations. I think that's yeah. very good. Well, I, I can't take the credit for it. I think the <laughs> cleverness of the whole thing was they picked the right topic. <laughs> well, I think I want to congratulate you. You re received the election to the National Academy of Engineering, that, right. along with the current Dean of Engineering. That's very nice. And how, tell me how that announcement come to you on that. <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Good. Uh, the personal touch. You, you, you can't nominate yourself, obviously. You have to have some uh, member of the academy to nominate you. And uh, the person that nominated me was the vice president for research at the University of Michigan. And then uh, supporting letters are appropriate, and one of them came from the former dean of engineering at Michigan, who I had served on a, on a committee with. Uh, one of them came from the director of the um, <coughs> uh, NASA uh, Center out at, in uh, California, and uh, he was a, he's a remote sensing guy too, and one of them came from the former Dean of Engineering of the University of Texas, and he's a remote sensing guy that I had served on the committee with. So that's pretty much how it came about. You, you're nominated. It's pretty unusual if you are elected the first time. Uh, you can go be renominated almost automatically for the second time. Then you have to lay out for X number of years before you can be nominated again. Well, I got in on the third try. Uh, and the way you find out that you have been elected is a, um, um, an express mail truck pull, pulls up to your door and brings a package to you, which has a bunch of stuff in it and a letter that says you've been elected. And the funny thing about it was when I went to the induction ceremony. I went, tell us a little bit about that too. Uh, that's held at the National Academy building in on Constitution Avenue in Washington. And uh, they, they introduce each person who is, who is elected. And when they introduced uh, one guy, he, was the, he is the CEO of uh, UPS. And <coughs> It Mike, was pointed Mike out Esk that Mike Eskew. Pardon? Mike Eskew. I don't remember his name. Oh, okay. <coughs> but it was pointed out that the FedEx truck pulled up in front of his house and brought him the package, and the guy making the introduction said, "You can just imagine that the wires were burning up between his house and the uh, <laughs> the person responsible for UPS in that region as to why they didn't have that account." But he was one of the people that was elected at the same time. Another fellow that was elected at the That's same time was the, the designer of the Apple iPod. Oh, okay. Well, it was a nice, nice ceremony. Yeah. And quite a few people. They have international ones that get in too. Yeah, they? they have. Uh, they're not full members, but they are. Uh, they are members of. Sure. Associates of the academy. Right. Yes. Um, well, tell us. Uh, your family. Did you meet your wife here at Purdue? I tell met us my about wife while both of us were in graduate school here. Okay. And uh, we have three children, and they all have Purdue degrees. Okay. What, was your, what did your wife do her graduate work in? She was a, a teacher, and she was doing a uh, master's degree in summers, and then she taught in the first in the Fort Wayne area, and then she was uh, uh, taught at uh, South Bend Adams High School. Okay. And then when we were married, she came here, and she taught over in the, the junior high school across town. Oh, that's very good. Okay. Oh, tell us a little bit about in your. Uh, have you been active at all in the alumni as a? Not really. Okay. Not really. Um, but you sort of can go to some of the activities and then and and tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in retirement. Some of your activities. Well, I still, I still do professional kinds of things. Good. I still spend most days in front of my computer, most day long, uh, one way or another, <laughs> uh, corresponding with people, and sure. I do a lot of review of of uh, journal papers for various editors and various journals. Um, that keeps you pretty busy, yeah. trying to keep up with it. Yeah. Well, uh, it's one way, frankly, it's, it's uh, self-affecting in that one of the things you worry about when you get retire is that you will grow out of date. And if you do that kind of work, that's one of the ways you stay up to date as to what people are working on and what kind of troubles they're having and all that. Right. Keep the contacts going. Keep the net, keep in the network. That's exactly right. right. Um, yeah, what is one of your longest memories of Purdue? Do you have a long memory? Anything that comes to mind? Well, probably the pivotal event in my Purdue life was that Ralph Shea uh, seminar at Double E because up to that time I had been focused primarily on teaching. 
I had been had responsibility for one of the undergraduate courses and I changed it all around and did a number of things of that nature and was still looking for how I'm going to get my research program going. And that really turned the light on for me that, ah, I think I see a way that I can make a contribution based on what I had done in my PhD thesis, what I had done in industry, and than what this problem presented. And so that's, that was really a key event as far as I was concerned. Very good, kind of come together. Um, any questions that you'd like to ask that uh, were not asked or any summary comments that you'd like to make? No, no, I think you've covered it very well. I also want to make a mention that, you, uh, that the source of the website is very good and I encourage our researchers that are going to be using that to also use it. It's very, and you keep it current, which is, it's well, it's well laid out. Oh, good. It really good. is. Was very I, really, easy to follow. I put it there, frankly, because uh, you need a tool to attract graduates, good quality graduate students from around the world. Right. And uh, they always want to know something about what you're doing and what you've done and all that. So that's really what its point was. And since I've retired, I haven't worried about it too much. But uh, it's very, uh, it's, and it's easy. It, it's easily accessible, which is nice. And people can, you know, look at it and pick up the information. It's very good. Uh, a, a lot of it is a matter of, okay, there's multi-spec, and then if people are really serious students, they want to get into uh, more of what's behind the algorithms that are in it, and that's why the published papers are there that you can download. Uh, which is very good. Okay. <coughs> good. I want to thank you very much for this interview, and my pleasure, and okay. thank you. This ends Happy thank to do you. it. It's uh, kind of fun to reminisce. Oh, listen, it's great. <laughs>